Mexi. Goodbye 2020. Despite how farcically atrocious this year has been, I hope that this series has shown you that through it all, we have been pushing the struggle forward. Even in our lowest points this year, we have seized on opportunities to catalyze rapid change and to push forward public discourse on major issues. So let's leave this year on a high note, honoring what our comrades have been able to do internationally in this final month of the most cursed year. In arguably the largest strike in human history, 250 million workers and farmers shut down India over the fascist Modi government's new liberalized agriculture laws, which they say would leave them poverty-stricken and at the mercy of corporations. Farmers make up 40% of the population in India, which famously has one of the highest rates of farmer suicide in the world. Organized by 10 trade unions and supported by the Indian National Congress, the Communist Party of India, and other left-wing parties, the strike converged with the march to New Delhi where hundreds of thousands of people remained camped out for weeks. They refused to leave until the government meets their demands, including repealing the anti-farmer and anti-worker agricultural reforms, providing direct cash transfers to all families who earn less than the income tax threshold, providing 10 kilograms of grain per person each month to all in need, providing pensions for all, and stopping the privatization of public services, among other things. As talks with the government have thus far failed, farmers are calling for another national strike and for protests to intensify. As one farmer yelled to police at the barricades around New Delhi, this is a revolution, sir. The VP of an Apple supplier in India was also removed this month after workers who had not been paid for their labor trashed the place, causing millions in damage. Trying to put out the fire, the company Wistron fired the VP and said that its top priority is to ensure all workers are fully compensated immediately. They also established an employee's assistance program for workers at the facility. In Brazil, an unhoused people's occupation in Fortaleza Sierra successfully forced the government to construct homes for the 85 families involved. The occupation, named Occupation Carlos Marighella in honor of the Brazilian Marxist-Leninist politician and guerrilla fighter, was previously a tent encampment in an abandoned area. But after being evicted last month, the group mobilized and occupied the mayor's party headquarters, forcing the mayor to recognize their rights to safe shelter. The municipality is now getting to work on building them homes using materials that were obtained by activists of their own initiative or donated from people in solidarity with the cause. Housing is a human right and no family should have to go to these lengths to access it. San Francisco voters overwhelmingly voted for a new law that will levy a 0.1% tax on companies that pay their CEO more than 100 times the median of their workforce. The tax increases by 0.1 percentage point for each factor of 100 that a CEO is paid above above the median, up to a maximum of 0.6%. And yes, there are many executives making more than 600 times the median wage of their workforce. Space Karen last year made 10,000 times the firm's median salary. Unfucking believable We're going to need a lot more than this tax to redress this, but it's a small and welcome step in bringing light to this sick exploitation. In a victory for organizers and workers, 15 municipalities in the Netherlands voted to raise the minimum wage to 14 euros per hour, and several others have joined the fight in their own local districts. This will improve conditions significantly for essential workers. Argentina is taxing the rich to support poor communities and fight COVID-19. Congress passed a one-time tax of 2% for people with assets over 2.4 million, and the revenue generated will pay for supplies to fight the virus and help small businesses and low-income neighborhoods. And due to a successful public pressure campaign, President Jokowi has declared that the COVID vaccine will be free for all Indonesians. Fantastic news. Now Bill Gates can track them all, and that will help the left in some way. For real though, healthcare of course should be a human right for all, not a luxury of the super rich. Workers at Verso Books have organized and unionized, joining the Washington Baltimore News Guild, a unit of the News Guild and the Communications Workers of America. The move formalizes the policies that staff have organized around for the last several years, including salary banding and a democratic decision-making process. Workers at an Amazon warehouse in Alabama have notified the National Labor Relations Board that they want to hold a union 
unionization vote to cover 1,500 full and part-time workers. This isn't a win yet, but we'll keep our eyes on this because it could set an enormous precedent. While European Amazon workers tend to be unionized, the company has fought off and discouraged unionization across America. So this would be the first ever labor unionization at a U.S. Amazon facility. As well, Amazon workers in six different locations across Germany have been striking since Black Friday. They decided to extend their strike until Christmas, effectively debilitating the corporation in the lead up to the holidays. Again, this is not a win yet, but fantastic show of solidarity among workers nationwide, which we'll be watching closely. After tens of thousands of people in cities across France erupted in protest, Macron's government was forced to withdraw a draft bill that would prohibit protesters from filming police in action. Article 24 of the bill would have criminalized the publication of images of on-duty police officers, and offenders would have faced sentences of up to a year in jail and fines of 45,000 euros. As we all know, having the freedom to document abuse from the armed protectors of private property is essential particularly in light of the systemic racism inherent in the institution. The controversy intensified after police in France were caught on video brutally beating up a black man and forcibly removing a migrant camp in central Paris. Following the protests with the bill dropped, four police officers were charged with assault and three were charged with fabricating their statement on the incident. In an extremely rare move, a so-called forever prisoner at Guantanamo Bay, who has been locked up for 18 years without ever being criminally charged, has been cleared for release. It's no secret that Gitmo is an extrajudicial hell space where people are stripped of all rights and held without evidence or charge, which is what happened to Saeed Nashir, a Yemeni man in his 40s accused of being an Al-Qaeda operative. Guantanamo's periodic review board, which functions like a parole board, said he is not a significant threat to the United States. Surprise, surprise. He is only the second Guantanamo prisoner to be approved for release during the Trump administration and the first to be cleared through this parole-like process. Big shout out to Elliot Page who came out as transgender this month and brought attention to many of the systemic issues still facing trans people. This representation in popular culture is incredibly important and possibly millions of men are now realizing that they can, in fact, have a crush on a man. A slew of pro-LGBTQ legislation was passed this month across the world. In Switzerland, lawmakers voted to legalize same-sex marriage and to allow transgender people to change their legal gender by making a declaration at a civil registry office. The Kingdom of Bhutan officially decriminalized homosexuality. The country is famous for its gross national happiness index, which they use as an alternative to gross domestic product, and the recognition of the rights of LGBTQ people seems pretty pivotal to such an index. The Constitutional Court of Romania ruled that the law prohibiting education about gender identity is unconstitutional, opening the door for kids to learn about the fluidity of gender identity and to feel confident in expressing their own. And finally, Bolivia has approved the first same-sex union. While same-sex marriage is still illegal, Bolivian activists believe that this union and others like it will pave the way for an overhaul of the country's marriage laws. And another huge shout out to Eric Sofia and Natalie who raised over 51000 pounds for trans healthcare in the UK this month. Hi Mexi, hi Positive Leftist News. Last month UK transphobes manipulated the UK court system into ruling that under 16s couldn't consent to puberty blockers. Puberty blockers, if you don't know, are a harmless medication that just puts puberty on hold so that trans kids can get the right hormones after they turn 16 because going through the wrong puberty is a really horrifying ordeal that drives a lot of kids to despair. Unfortunately, as I said, transphobes manipulated the UK court system into ruling that under 16s couldn't consent to this medication, so the Tavistock Centre, the only NHS centre in the UK that is treating trans kids, was ringing up trans kids and taking them off prescriptions they were already on. It was really messed up. So in response to this, on Twitter I said I would do a fundraiser stream to pay directly for trans kids' treatment, and I said I would keep going until I raised £10,000. I found out that Gender GP a private medical practitioner in the UK had set up a fund to do this, give money directly to pay for the treatment of trans kids. After that I got busy with the video and I forgot to plan anything, but it came around so I had to I had to pick some stuff. I, I decided to play Hades, I said because being trans in the UK is like being in hell, appropriate. We just kind of started doing it. I cut together a, a quick trailer that I put on my channel. These hateful, sad people aren't going to stop trying to make us disappear, but we aren't going to. Come watch, share, and donate. 
to the Hades stream for hope. A lot of people turned up. We hit the £10,000 goal within the first three hours of the weekend, but we still had three days to go. So um, we ended up raising £50,000 instead. And not only that, but during the stream, um, Dr. Helen Webberly, the founder of Gender GP, showed up and pledged that Gender GP would match our donations in kind. That doesn't mean that they'll give their money, but it means that they, you know, for every uh, hour of a doctor's time that we can pay for, they'll make sure it's two hours. They'll double the amount of treatment, the amount of service, the, 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 the health care that goes to those kids. So effectively, it's uh, worth a, a lot more than the, what we actually raised. The really good news here is that according to the statistics I've heard, there were only about a hundred kids who were on puberty blocker prescriptions already who have been threatened by this Tavistock decision, and the money we've raised with Gender GP's pledge should cover the treatment of all of them. <laughs> So we may well have uh, made the court decision redundant while other people are working to overturn it. If you want to check out the Good Law Project, they're kind of like the SPLC, but in the UK, they're fighting to do a lot of social justice good in the UK. And for example, they're fighting to overturn that decision. It was a really cool weekend. We had the writer of Hades come on. We had a couple of the other voice actors. In total, we ended up with four of the characters from Hades all saying trans rights, some of them saying F turfs. And uh, besides that, we just had a cool time doing it. So that's some positive leftist news for you all. Enjoy the show. In yet another humiliation for Trump, a federal judge has ordered his administration to fully restore the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA program, which protects undocumented immigrants brought to the U.S. as children from deportation. For the first time since 2017, the program will be open to new applicants. The judge also ordered officials to grant approved applicants two-year work permits instead of the one-year period proposed by the Trump administration. Approximately one million children and teens now qualify for DACA and can soon applied to the program. This month, the Argentinian feminist movement's decades of tireless work finally paid off, with Argentina set to become the first major Latin American country to legalize abortion. The lower house passed the bill after a 20-hour debate. It now moves on to the Senate, which is expected to clear the bill in the final days of December. So by the time you are watching this, Argentina will have made history. Deborah Diniz, a prominent reproductive rights activist from Brazil, said that the decision would have a contagion effect and she doesn't have the slightest doubt other countries could follow Argentina's lead. This is wonderful news for all people with uteruses in Latin America where millions of covert and unsafe abortions are conducted each year. And France is in the process of extending the time frame for legal abortions from 12 to 14 weeks. The bill has been approved and is supported by the Ethics Committee formed by the government and it will move to the Senate in January. According to the Ethics Committee's report, 1,500 to 2,000 French pregnant people are getting abortions abroad each year due to the 12-week limit, such as in Spain, the Netherlands, or the UK, where the limit is 22 weeks. This statistic doesn't include everyone that can't afford such a trip and who try to abort illegally or themselves, which is incredibly dangerous. An indigenous land back movement in New Zealand made progress this month. Ihumatau, a sacred site in South Auckland, was seized from the Maori in 1863 and sold to Fletcher Building in 2016. It was slated for private development until the intervention of Maori activists and allies who staged a peaceful occupation at the site for more than 500 days. Because of their incredible effort, the Labour government agreed to buy the land back from Fletcher Building to the tune of about $30 million. Although the government is not currently giving the land back to the Maori as it should, the land is now slated to be used for public housing along with space for heritage and cultural activities for the benefit of the area's Maori community. The Australian Federal Court has overturned Environment Minister Susan Lay's decision to reject an appeal for the protection of six sacred trees in the path of a highway upgrade in Victoria. The appeal for protection was made by the Jab Wurrung Heritage Protection Embassy, an indigenous organization founded specifically to protect sacred trees that have been an integral part of the Jab Wurrung people's birthing traditions for over 50 generations. The trees themselves are over 800 years old, and their lives and cultural significance are immeasurable. Bolivia hosted a Congress of Latin American Social Movements chaired by Evo Morales. They aim to lead the unification and liberation of the continent on the basis of plurinationalism to reflect the diversity of the cultures of the people. Indigenous and social movement leaders from Peru, Colombia, Guatemala, Venezuela,
Venezuela and Brazil participated in this two-day conference. The Confederación de Nacionalidades Indígenas del Ecuador say that neoliberal governments are scared because the indigenous people of the Americas are uniting. Fucking right. And after years of protests from indigenous groups and fans, Cleveland's baseball team will finally drop its racist name. Many fans praised the move, while Orange Man decried it as cancel culture at work. Except nobody is canceling the team, dude. Just the racism. The Mexican government has passed a law that curtails the DEA's action in their country. Given that the DEA has been a corrupt imperialist force in the country responsible for countless deadly and botched operations, this is wonderful news for the people of Mexico. Essentially, the legislation strips DEA agents of diplomatic immunity and forces agents from the DEA, FBI, and other agencies to submit whatever intelligence they collect to Mexican officials. Even phone calls and texts between U.S. agents and Mexican officials will receive written reports sent to multiple government departments. The DEA's former chief of international operations, Mike Vigil, said the big winners in this entire process are the cartels, who have to be celebrating with this convoluted and disastrous outcome. Sadly, the Mexican government is shooting itself in the foot. Please, Mike, you are just pissed that you can no longer use Mexico as a playground for your organization's own organized crime. The DEA has ruined countless lives at home and abroad and should be abolished. Although millions of people around the world wear prosthetic limbs, comfort, functionality, and cost remain huge barriers to access. They can go from $5,000 to $120,000, which is one of the major reasons why many of those without an upper limb choose not to wear a prosthetic. Now, thanks to 3D printing and open source community building, innovative workers are helping those without limbs sidestep large profit-seeking companies by linking them with a network of smaller workshops. The organization heading up this project, My Human Kit allows people to co-design their own artificial limbs at a fraction of the typical cost and produces them at a much faster rate, which is particularly helpful for kids who quickly outgrow their prosthetics. In another 2020 surprise, the US Supreme Court has ruled in favor of the religious freedom of a group of Muslims. The men argued that their religious freedom was being infringed upon when the FBI placed them on no-fly lists, not because they were suspected of being involved in criminal activity, but simply because the feds wanted to punish them for not agreeing to become undercover informants, something they have forced countless Muslim Americans to do under duress. The Supreme Court ruled that the three men can now sue the FBI for damages, which sets a great precedent for Muslim Americans and other religious minorities. A bill supporting the right to a dignified death in Spain has passed the lower house. It will be debated in the Senate and could become law early in 2021. This would make Spain the sixth country in the world and the fourth in the EU to allow people who are suffering from serious incurable conditions to request and receive assistance to end their lives. In Puerto Rico, voters dealt their two-party system a below last month as a newly formed anti-neoliberal party advocating for statehood, the Citizens' Victory Movement, and the Progressive Independence Party captured a combined vote of 28% and historic turnout. Although the PNP ended up winning, the two established neoliberal parties' favor dropped significantly. The new leftist party was formed after mass protests un seated Governor Ricardo Rossello representing the PNP. Puerto Ricans also voted for statehood again during a referendum on the subject, so pressure needs to be mounted on Congress to finally remove Puerto Rico from its colonial status. And in Kerala, India, the communist state praised for its remarkable handling of the coronavirus pandemic. Local body elections this month saw the left democratic front winning more seats than all of the opposition parties combined, despite the virulent attacks from the fascist Modi government's party, BJP, and the center-right Indian National Congress, who controlled the media narrative and refused to report positively on all of the gains made for workers under the left democratic front, including the creation of 34 new public schools and the building of 250,000 homes for working people. One of the candidates to win her seat is 21-year-old Araya Rajendran, the youngest mayor of a major city in the world. She said local bodies are the nerves of the democratic process of Kerala. It is important that we have young people committed to the cause of democracy being elected to office. It is through local office that we can make 
sure that everyone benefits from the left alternative being developed in the state. Boris Johnson is a complete asshole, and surely this is a political calculation, but the UK has announced that it will end subsidies for fossil fuel projects abroad. The UK is an important source of funds for fossil fuel projects overseas, often providing loans to British companies involved or underwriting loans from British banks. Britain has supplied £21 billion to overseas oil and gas projects in the last four years, and an end to this is more than welcome. Denmark has announced it will end all new oil and gas exploration in the North Sea as part of their plan to stop fossil fuel extraction by 2050. Denmark is currently the largest oil producer in the EU, although it produces much less than non-EU members Norway or the UK. Denmark's climate minister announced we are now putting a final end to the fossil era. And I wanted to end once again with the cutest news of all, the fantastic conservation stories of 2020. This year has been devastating for human populations reliant on a cruel and dysfunctional capitalist system that cannot support people through crises. The capital slowdown has helped a lot of our non-human relatives as travel and tourism has declined. I talked last month about the baby Ridley sea turtles in the Gulf of Mexico, but this year also saw scientists describing a new species of mouse lemur in Madagascar, where lemurs have been extremely endangered for some time now, with 98% of species threatened with extinction. This new species was first discovered in 2006, but was not fully understood or described until now. Scientists also rediscovered a chameleon that was last seen a hundred years ago. Researchers wrote, our planet is probably facing the beginning of an enormous extinction of species, often referred to as the sixth mass extinction, the Holocene extinction, or the Anthropocene extinction. Rediscoveries of lost species are very important as they provide crucial data for conservation measures and also bring some hope amidst the biodiversity crisis. Wild highland singing dogs thought to be extinct in Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, have also been found surviving and thriving. Scientists haven't seen these dogs in the wild since the 1970s. And Tasmanian devils, which were eradicated from mainland Australia, have made a small comeback in the state of New South Wales. The organization Aussie Ark reintroduced 26 little devils into state forests. Tim Faulkner, president of Aussie Ark, said not only is this the reintroduction of one of Australia's beloved animals, but of an animal that will engineer the entire environment around it, restoring and rebalancing our forest ecology after centuries of devastation from introduced foxes and cats and other invasive predators. Because of this reintroduction and all of the hard work leading up to it, someday we will see Tasmanian devils living throughout the Great Eastern Forest as they did 3,000 years ago. Comrades, if you have good news to share from the current month, please send your stories to veganvanguardpodcast at gmail.com or at me at MexiYT on Twitter. Thank you to Javi for the positive news jams. Thank you to Halcyon for the positive news background. And thank you to Tristan for editing this video. Special thanks, of course, to my patrons who make the show possible. If you would like to become a sustaining member, please sign up on Patreon. The link is in the description box of the video below. You can also provide a one-time payment via PayPal or simply share these videos with friends, family, or give us a like, a comment, and subscribe to increase our reach. Any form of support is greatly appreciated. Take care, comrades, and I will see you in another video.